takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello, thank you for joining us. My name is Konata Lake and I'm direct, a director of the Canadian Club, Toronto. As many parts of Canada grapple with the second wave of COVID-19, the future there is more uncertain than ever. Many businesses from retail to travel and hospitality continue to struggle as the econo economic opening is dialed back. Others, however, are booming. Amazon is hiring. The stock market is seeing a rush of new tech stock listing and gold miners are literally printing cash. What does Canada's economic recovery look like and what time frame are we looking at? Today, we're joined by an expert panel who will unpack these questions and discuss their forecasts for Canada's economy. Before we dive into today's topic, here's some information about how to participate with us. The click here to switch stream button helps you find that your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio quality should remain strong. Once you click the questions tab, you can enter your questions in the window and they will be sent to the moderator. The request help button located in the bottom right corner of the page is for technical support. Now to introduce today's panelists. Craig Alexander is a partner and chief economist for Deloitte Canada. Avery Shanfield is Managing Director and Chief Economist for CIBC. And Armin Yelnizen is an Atkinson Foundation Fellow on the Future of Workers. Today's panel will be moderated by Andrea Mandel Campbell, Senior Vice President, Financial and Crisis Communications for National Public Relations. One of the club's traditions that has not changed in this virtual world is, a to is the toast we make to our country. Usually done in person with the raisin glass, Let's make a nod towards the screen and toast Canada to Canada. Andrea, I'll turn the Canadian Club podium over to you. Thank you, Kanata. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today uh, to talk with some of Canada's leading economists about a really important question as we continue to make our way through COVID and uh, the waves of uh, lockdowns and the cascading effects that are coming from that. Um, I'd like to start off with a question for our guests, just you know, trying to get a handle on what we're seeing in terms of the many different, different signals that we're, we're seeing out there. We're seeing some sectors of the economy that are, are doing well, like natural resources or the tech sector, and then others that of course are struggling. I wanted to get a sense from each of you, if we could go around the table in the short term, what are the key indicators that you are looking at in terms of how you're assessing the economic recovery? Craig, maybe we start with you. Sure. Um, well, of course, I, I focus on a lot of the high frequency data that Statistics Canada reports that gives us uh, uh, the, the best tracking um, or one of the most accurate tracking of how the economy is doing. So we look at headline numbers like like, like real GDP, which is the amount of goods and services produced in the economy. We look at activities at the industry level. And to your point, you know, while we have seen a very sharp rebound in economic activity, which is actually far stronger than I think many forecasters were anticipating, what we actually have seen is that it has been very uneven when you look across industries. 
And so some of the hardest hit industries like like air transportation or hospitality food services, you know, they plunged the most and has recovered the least. Meanwhile, there's been some some very strong sectors like the overall recovery in, in retail spending that actually got back to its pre-COVID levels in June. But then what you saw when you dig below the surface is that it's very different depending on what part of retail you're looking at or what segment you're looking at. So I think that the headline numbers tell us a lot about the overall picture for Canada, but a lot of the stories about the economic scarring is coming from more detailed statistics. The other thing I'm looking a lot at, which, which I haven't in the past, is big data like we're looking at a lot of high frequency indicators that give us a, you know accurate picture of what's happening that minute because that scan data is lagged so a you know, good example of this is we look at data in terms of like foot traffic in retail outlets or the the volume of congestion on our highways to actually assess how the economy is doing in real time oh interesting um avery I'll turn it over to you of course, I look at the various things that uh, Craig was just talking about, but of course, there's a new favorite indicator for all of us, which is the daily COVID case counts. And I think the reality is that in terms of the recovery that we still have ahead of us, that's probably now the most important variable. Because if you look at uh, what Craig was talking about, the parts that have recovered and the parts that haven't, really the dividing line is sort of which segments of the economy are heavily impaired or completely closed because of social distancing requirements, which are because of the combination of either you don't get that close to people or masks seem to help uh, able to function well. And so a lot of the cup that's, you know, if you think of cup half empty, cup half full, a lot of the part of the cup that's empty are the sectors that are being held back by COVID. So we know to some extent that that limitation on getting the rest of the way there back to full employment is really going to lie in when do we put COVID behind us. So we're certainly watching for how well we're doing on that front. Second wave obviously hitting. And you can compare why that's relevant is you can look at some of the Pacific Rim countries, for example, that have largely kept themselves free of that second wave. They are doing better in some of these areas of their economy than we are now likely to do. So I'm an economist. Uh, my, I have a doctorate in economics. So sometimes I, I go by Dr. Schenfeld, but sometimes I wish I was a real doctor uh, because at this point, it's really all about infectious diseases. It's about the science of vaccination and how well that's going to work. And I'm spending a lot of my time delving into some of those uh, data points in addition to the economic ones that, of course, Craig mentioned. I want to touch a little bit more on what you, what you're getting at there, particularly with uh, the prospects for a vaccine. But before that, I just want to let um, Armin get in here and, and and share her thoughts on on what she's looking at in terms of how she's looking at the recovery. Uh, thank you, Andrea, and uh, it's a great pleasure being here. And I'm going to take my uh, dashboard approach primarily on labor force uh, indicators, whereas I agree completely with Avery that this is being driven by COVID. It isn't uniquely being driven by COVID. There is an economic and a policy uh, second step in this process. So I'm going to be looking at labor force participation rates for women. Uh, going into the pandemic, women were 50% of the employed labor force. And um, we're already seeing the very first ever drop off of women just pulling out of the labor market because there have not been safe reopening of schools. And a huge part of the childcare sector is run like a business and it's shuddering under the weight of pandemic economics, which is less revenue and more costs. Um, and so it's hugely dependent on public policy, but public policy is largely dropped the ball on being able to ensure that women can get back to work when there is work. The second part is, of course, a lot of the jobs that are going to shutter permanently are in marginal businesses uh, paying low paid wage, low wages to workers. And that's because the businesses themselves are operating on very low margins going into the pandemic and may not be able to expand this long period where they've got uh, reduced revenues. So I'm going to be looking at the rate of rebound for low wage workers uh, getting back into the labor market and restoring their hours of work, hugely important for purchasing power in the economy, household spending, which is the primary driver of GDP. And I'm also going to be looking at things like uh, the rate of foreclosures of uh, mortgages, 
you know, we've got a wave of uh, debt coming at us from both the commercial and the household side. We don't know how many people are going to be able to avoid eviction on the rent side. We don't know how many mortgages will be foreclosed. And we don't know how many businesses will be unable to stay in place. So looking at personal and corporate bankruptcies is a huge part of what I'm going to be looking at. And finally, I'll, I'll close with looking at purchasing power in the United States. How many people are unemployed? How many people have got have lost purchasing power? That's going to be a huge driver of our ability to float back up um, going forward. Okay, uh, these are all very good points, and a lot of them have both short-term and I think longer-term impacts, which we're going to tackle a little later on. But uh, Avery, going back to your point around the vaccine, I think there are two kind of um, issues that are kind of in the windshield right now, one being the U.S. election and the other being, you know, prospects around a vaccine and the current case count. We're seeing right now in Europe, um, you know, moving back into a second wave and, and, and talk around a double dip a recession as a result. Um, how how is the pro and, the, and there are prospect there are just, you know, a lot of discussions around the potential for a vaccine as early as December, January. How do you see that impacting the, our ability to recover? So uh, again, I, I take my uh, advice here from the experts. Uh, unlike a certain president, I actually think that Anthony Fauci is a pretty good source uh, for some of this information. And, and what the experts are telling us is with, we've got a lot of candidates in the fire. We haven't got actually the data on the third stage yet from uh, any of them really, uh, but we're expecting it in the coming month. And, you know, it, it is like having enough player at the craps table. Someone's likely to win. So we are expecting, you know, before the end of the year, in fact, at least one or two companies to actually be applying for, you know, the, the first stage of application towards uh, getting this drug out there in the community. The problem is that, again, listening to the experts, you have to be careful about uh, these dates because, we could well have a vaccine even approved for emergency use before the end of the year. Not unfortunately for a certain president by the first week of November, but maybe before the end of the year. But that doesn't mean that you and I um, are gonna get that vaccine anytime that soon. So the economy is waiting for this literal shot in the arm. And, and I think we are gonna get it, but uh, best bets are that vaccination in serious numbers sort of starts to ramp up towards the middle of 2021. And then we also have to, and this we don't know this yet, we need to know the efficacy of these vaccines. So these are unlikely to be like the measles vaccine, where you get the vaccine, you're good to go, you're not going to get COVID. These are more likely going to be like more akin to the flu vaccine, or maybe even not quite as effective, where you could still get COVID even though you've been vaccinated. So what we're going to be relying on is, in fact, that if if we get up to, say, 70 percent immunity because of the vaccine, we'll still have COVID cases, but they'll start to diminish. Again, it's going to take a few quarters, however, for this diminishing process to sort of get rid of the virus. So the way we look at it at CIBC is we start to get the ramp up in economic activity in the second half of next year. But full steam ahead is really, you know, let's be, uh, I think, cautious. It's probably a 2022 story. And given the damage that's been done to the economy, and Armin was talking about some of the issues of bringing people back. There may be businesses that have folded, so we need to build new restaurants and so on. You know, even with everything going right in the vaccine, full economic health is probably a 2023 story. So this is still a very early vaccine not so early a full recovery for the economy, unfortunately. Okay, and just to reiterate, you're saying 2023 before we're we're back up to full economic, well, where were we yeah. at? And that's actually earlier than the Federal Reserve. They're trying to tell financial markets, oh, not till 2024. And that may be just because they want to keep bond yields down as low as possible now. So the longer you can stretch out people's thoughts of when the economy is going to be better, the lower bond yields will be today. They'll be pricing in a very, very distant move to higher rates. I guess this is the only part of the story. I find myself a little more optimistic. I'm betting, I guess, on the scientists here um, and, and think that we might beat the Fed's projections by as much as a year in terms of a return to what I would think of as something close to full economic health. 
Mm -hmm. Craig, do you share that optimism? And I'm curious to know how you're, um, you know, modeling in the U.S. election and, and what impact that could have. Um, so I, I broadly agree with 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 Avery. Um, the one thing I would highlight, though, is that when I'm talking to clients, I <clears throat> I, I reinforce that we we need to think about scenarios. Like you can't plan your business on just one scenario. We we truly do not know what is going to transpire. You know, we're currently in the midst of a increase in the infection rates. We're seeing. Um, you know, more surgical lockdowns or restraints being put on the economy here in Canada, but also uh, also abroad. And and so our, our base case, you know, when we talk about, you know, this, you know, the timing of the recovery, I think I, I suspect and Avery can correct me if I'm wrong, but, the you know, the assumption is that the, the virus doesn't reach a point where we we have really broad based lockdowns again, like we had back in March and April. Um, so what we really need to think about is different scenarios. And I think there's a scenario that plays out where, you know, we manage the health risks, we have some surgical and targeted lockdowns to manage those risks, uh, but it doesn't become large enough to, to threaten the recovery. Then there's a scenario where um, the infection rates increase to a point where you have to get broader lockdowns, in which case you're starting to run the risks that the, the recovery stalls or even worse, you could have like a, a double dip if, if we had broad enough lockdowns. Um, and then the other thing I'm mindful of, and this is this links to your your comment about the U.S. election, is you know even if Canada manages its the health risks, one of the things we have to be mindful of is what happens to the health risks in our major trading partners. And you know if the U.S. has you know a second or third wave and it's it materially hurts their recovery. Well, Canada will import that weakness because of how we are, how deeply we are tied with the U.S. economy. The other thing I would say is, you know, with respect to the U.S. election, you know, we could speculate about what the outcome is going to be. The markets are currently pricing in the Democrats um, managing to sweep both the, both the, both the, 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 the you know, basically taking control of Congress and taking the White House. Uh, but we'll see. But the most important thing in my mind when it comes to U.S. recovery is is whether or not the government income supports that were previously put in place are lost. You know, so in Canada, one of the things that's helping our recovery is the fact that the government of Canada has said that workers who are unemployed will be transferred onto programs that will give them good income support, that wage subsidies for businesses will be extended to next summer. But in the United States, there's a bigger question about whether the government income supports could be lost quickly. And if that happens, that could actually jeopardize the US, the US, the US recovery, which then impacts Canada. So, you know, in my mind, there's two big risks, risks here. The number one risk is the health risk. And the number two risk is the political risk associated with, with, with the, the, the scaling back or reduction of government support programs that could impact the shape of the recovery. I mean, I'd like to, to get your thoughts on this. Do you see, um, you know, depending on the way the U.S. election turns out, one more beneficial to Canada than the other? Without question. I mean, to Craig's point, the degree of reliance on the American purchasing power and supply chains and the spillovers with the U.S. economy are, I'm not making a controversial statement here, that we're very reliant on how the U.S. economy does. And under each scenario, you've either got a very slow rebound or an absolute cratering of household purchasing power there. Um, so we have the potential poised for the biggest economic disaster in US history because it almost doesn't matter who wins. There's a great deal of planned disruption on the other side of the election results no matter what happens. So uh, we do have to, I agree completely with Craig, you have to look into the uncertainty fog with plans in your back pocket, uh, plan A, plan B, but I'm not hopeful based on what has happened thus far with things as predictable as, again, school reopenings or testing and tracing or plans for more surgical or targeted lockdowns. I mean, we like to blame what might be happening in the United States, but we haven't been doing that great um, in Canada. And looking at the vaccine story, again, as Avery said, not much can happen because you can't get enough of the population in Canada in the U.S., around the world at a scale fast enough, and we, we ain't seen nothing yet with respect to the rates of infection, the rates of hospitalization, the rates of death, which are poised to reach new highs in the coming weeks. 
10 months, um, we're going to see huge numbers of small businesses and even some bigger ones collapse under the weight of pandemic economics, which is higher costs and lower volumes of business. So are we looking at a double dip? Um, absolutely, we are looking at a double dip. At the macro level, there's no question in my mind about that. Much more importantly is there was never a rebound for the lower leg of the economy, the low-paid workers in any country. This has been something that has happened all around the world uh, because of the nature of the marginal businesses, the non-essential marginal businesses that were shut down that pay their workers very poorly. Those businesses are by and large gone. You know, uh, Dan Kelly of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business said about a month ago now, you know, most there's a lot of small businesses that have died. They just haven't had a funeral yet. So I think that the more this goes on, the more we have to look at targeted lockdowns or something worse because we didn't do targeted locks, lockdowns. We're looking at major uh, loss of opportunities to get back into the labor market. The longer that takes, the more economic scarring there is, the less we have to rebuild from. Well, and just to follow on with that, I mean, talking about, you know, Canada has obviously provided the Canadian government, Bank of Canada, you know, some pretty massive uh, injections to keep the, the economy afloat, keep wages afloat, uh, businesses afloat. But um, to your point, um, they can only hold on for so long. We know serb has been, um, it, you know, uh, continued for another 26 weeks. What do you think potentially happens at the end of those 26 weeks, I mean? Well, I think there's a lot of people that are very nervous about um, very, is my video off from, from your Yes. There we go. There you are. Um, from, from my perspective, I, I understand there's a lot of people out there that are very nervous about how much federal deficit there is, but we are in an environment here where debt is going to go up in the economy. Households are going to be in debt and businesses are going to be in debt. Debt. So the only question is, who holds the debt and how do we prevent the economy from cratering? That to me is the really big story. It's unclear when or if you can turn off CERB or uh, the Canada Recovery Benefit or the $40,000 loans to business or the rent subs, any, any of these things without making things even worse. And I think that's the, uh, given that we're in a po population and public health moment, uh, the advice would have to be don't make things worse. Okay. Um, all right. I want to I want to go around the table here because there's been a lot of speculation around what that recovery. If you had to choose a letter, what letter would you give it? I mean, we've talked about the potential for a double dip, which I'm going to assume is a W. Um, you know, when when this when COVID first started, there's a lot of optimism out there. It would be a V-shaped recovery, a, a significant drop, and then we'd kind of bounce back up. We saw a lot of uh, you know we saw some healthy bounce back in Q3, but once again, with the second wave coming, that's changed. A lot of numbers thrown out there, L's, W, U, and even a K. Um, uh, Craig, maybe start with you. Uh, give, give us a sense of what you see the shape of the recovery being. Avery's mentioned timeline, but I'd be curious to get your sense. Yeah, sure. Um, and um, viewers might be confused by the letter K. Like when you think about... <laughs> You know, so the idea of a V shape is the economy goes down and it rebounds and you get back to pre-COVID levels very quickly. Um, you know, in we're seeing a lot of V shapes at the moment because we turned the economy back on. But the question is, what does it look like after that initial bounce? Because by the time we got to September, that uh, that reopening effect was behind us. And so I think that the, the the graphs as we move forward are not going to look nearly as 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 V-shaped or continuing the path they were on. Um, I think our, our base case forecast is like a is more like a check mark or a Nike swoosh, where you fall a long way, but then it takes you a really long time to get back to where where you started before. I don't know how Nike feels about their symbol being used for for this sort of uh, economic scenarios. Um, but the K, the K also, you know, there's also an element of truth around the, the, the K shape because that, the concept there is the two branches coming off the, the vertical line that you have industries that, are, that are, are, are rebounding or thriving and you have industries that are suffering um, very badly and not recovering. And obviously, if the health risks increase, the hard hit industries are the ones that are going to be hard hit again. 
right? And so, you know, we immediately know that it's like, it's, it's groups like air transportation and hospitality and food services and tourism and um, segments of retail. Um, you know, there's, there's, and this is where, again, like the, I, I'm not sure the aggregate national picture truly tells you what's, what's, what's transpiring. Like it, it, it's important from, for, for, from certain perspectives, but from a business point of view on the ground, it, it, it's going to look very different depending on what segment you're in. The other thing is when, when I've talked to our clients, some of the clients that you would actually think of as being, you know, in the, the upward sloping of the K, the ones that are, that, the ones that have thrived in this environment, they're actually still having enormous challenges. Right. So you, you've got situations where the companies are doing well, but their supply chains are deeply, deeply disrupted. And, you know, they're having issues with inventories or they're having issues with suppliers or, you know, the cost of transportation has increased dramatically because there's not enough containers to, you know, there's containers that are just holding inventories that aren't being sold. And then there's containers, not enough containers for products that are in demand. Um, and then at the other end of the scale, of course, you have the, the, the hard hit industries, which which are, are suffering badly and, and unfortunately are going to have an exceedingly long recovery. Um, I, you know, I'm hoping we don't get a W, which is the double dip. Um, I can certainly come up with that scenario in a very easy way. It's just a question of how high the infection, gets, infection rates get and how much of renewed lockdown you get. And again, this is precisely why businesses, when they're doing their their planning when they're doing their um, when they're thinking about risk management. When boards of directors are talking to their companies, they need to be thinking about you know how is the firm or how is the company going to deal with these these different outcomes, which all of course have deep implications for labor markets in Canada and employees, right? And so you know everything uh, everything that um, Armin has talked about in terms of you know the the blow to low paid workers, the fact that more of our vulnerable workers are the ones that are carrying the load in terms of the, the impact from this recession. Um, that, all of that, there is a very strong inequality dimension to this downturn. Yeah, agreed. And I think we can apply that K in that respect as well in terms of thinking of the upward slope as, you know, white collar professionals often and um, the, one, the, the downward slope as, you know, the, the salaried workers at, at the front lines. Um, Avery, your thoughts on your letter of choice and or are you buying into the Nike swoosh? Well, I don't think I'm going to pick another letter, um, but I, I will. Um, I, I'm going to actually speak to a little bit about the second wave issue and how serious this is and the lockdown and so on. One of the things we do have to remember is we did learn something uh, between the time we did the first lockdown, which was indeed sweeping massive. And, and what's happening now. And what we learned is that actually there are activities that we shut down in the first wave because we thought those could be potential routes to contagion that we now know are not. Um, and we know they're not, not because we learned something new, but because we learned how effective masks were actually at enabling us to do those activities safely. So we locked down, of course, a huge swath of the economy. Every little store, every clothing store and so on was closed. But what we're seeing in the data is that people can walk into a store, try on a shirt, uh, wear their mask while they're doing that. The staff is wearing a mask. They leave the store. No one has gotten COVID as a result of that. And so the result is that even though the second wave is in many countries already eclipsing the first wave, it's not necessarily the case that we're going to lock down nearly as much. So to give you some perspective on this, uh, the service sector was, of course, very front and center in this when the lockdown began. And we lost something in Canada on the order of a million and a half service sector jobs in the space of two months after uh, March, uh, between February sort of and April. Uh, we regained about a million of them. And even if we extend, for example, this uh, lockdown of indoor dining, gyms, um, and bars uh, across the country, we're talking about a non insignificant number of jobs, a couple hundred thousand jobs may be at risk, uh, but that's not one and a half million. So I think we will see a couple of months maybe where GDP dips. Um, it could be November, in fact, even could be the first month where we see an actual decline because that's when these new measures came in in both Quebec and in Ontario, at least they'll be in for the full month. But we might not see you know, a full negative quarter. I hope we can avoid it. And I hope that the lesson that we've learned 
uh, from that first lockdown means that with masks, we don't need to lock down as much. And the second thing I'd say on the optimistic side is we do have to remember that there are some countries that have done much better than we did in Canada in containing COVID. Um, not only countries, but for that matter, we have within Canada, we have Newfoundland, which is doing just fine. There's no second wave. No one's getting COVID in Newfoundland. Now it helps to be an island. Uh, but it is that really, a, is it comparable to use Newfoundland? Well, okay, but we've got China which was, after all, the source of all evil, according to Donald Trump, when it comes to this story. And they've right. got their bars and restaurants open. Uh, they have their schools open. The only but thing they, they don't know open they, is didn't churches. They contract, didn't they contact trace 9 million people? Sorry. Yes, so that's exactly right. So what, we have, what the lesson we have to learn here is, if we don't want to decimate our economy while we're waiting for the vaccine, we have to become a little more like China, a little more like Taiwan, a little more like South Korea in terms of not just shutting things down and saying that's the whole story, but rather we have to get cases down initially, then we have to aggressively test and contract trace. We know that actually mass spreading events are much more important than one to one. So we need to be on top of where those events are happening, identify where they are, try to figure out what we need to close. But we could be much, much better at this than we have been so far. Um, I think, I mean, I mean, made the point we we compare ourselves a lot to the U.S. That's a Canadian sport. Um, and we think, oh, well, look how much better we're doing than them. But we're not really doing all that well in absolute terms. After all, the opening that we did for restaurants and bars and gyms in Ontario, it was a failure because we weren't able to keep them open. But other jurisdictions have, and we need to take the lessons from those jurisdictions about how to. And I guess I'm going to continue to hold on to a little ray of optimism that uh, the governments will go to school, that will put the right systems in place, and that will become a little more like China, a little more like Taiwan, uh, and a little less like our friends to the South, where admittedly their failure will be an economic cost to Canada, uh, at least until, again, the vaccine's in place. Armin, um what do you think are, are the prospects of Canada actually being able to be a little bit more like uh, China and Taiwan? And a follow-up question on that is from our audience is, how would you rate the job that the federal and provincial governments have done so far in terms of, of restarting the Canadian economy? So uh, I, I don't know that China is the uh, exemplar. I think uh, there are many other fine exemplars like uh, uh, New Zealand, South Korea, Japan, Denmark, and I would uh, I would hope that we would aspire to those more so than China because I I think there were some real dubious things to take out of the data that uh, China is um, sharing uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but I think the really important thing is to make the distinction that this is an all of society effort. And we are seeing the, I think what the federal government has done has been remarkable in the early stage of containing the contagion. Um, our the CERB was not done everywhere, but the type of uh, income support that was provided through CERB, which went directly to people that not only lost their jobs, but lost more than half their hours of work um, and reached almost everybody except migrant workers who were extremely exposed to the virus and students. Um, so those are the two blind spots, but otherwise a very broad-based uh, support that reached over 8 million people at its peak. So clearly not just the unemployed. It really did keep households afloat in terms of purchasing power. Most countries just did wage subsidies, and we were late to the wage subsidy game, actually. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be very interesting to see when we decide to turn off those supports because of the conversation we had earlier. But where I have to say that the federal government succeeded, I would also assess that the provincial governments failed and largely failed. Um, I think there are some jurisdictions that did well. I think British Columbia has done extremely well in trying to manage things, but there's a huge libertarian streak running through that province too, where people don't wanna to be told what to do. And we've seen that that has led to an increase again in uh, cases. And that is absolutely the bottom line, is to contain the contagion. Everything else flows after that. Here in Ontario, where I live and where we're speaking, 
from. I think everybody that's on this call is speaking from Ontario. It has been a shit show, I think is the technical term. <laughs> Uh, none, nothing has made sense. Guidance has not followed public policy, uh, public health guidance. Uh, what is open, what is shut, what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do, it just seems to be like, who knows what's driving it? It's unclear. So I think the provinces have really dropped the ball on long-term care and child care. In other words, the parts of the economy that are social infrastructure. You know, in, in Ontario, uh, the uh, the the Minister of Education is quick to say that 93% of child care centers have reopened, but does not tell us how many people are in, have enrolled. The child care centers are having two problems. First of all, loss of business because parents are unwilling to risk their children's exposure and workers that don't want to come in. So in the city of Toronto, uh, the last data we've seen uh, that is, has been made public is 37% enrollment. If I was the Minister of Transportation and I said to you, 37% of your roads and bridges in this jurisdiction are functioning, you would know you need a plan. There is no plan. We're standing by while these, these businesses are essentially cratering and they are essentially businesses, unlike schools that are publicly funded and delivered. They, will, they are not guaranteed to reopen. And yeah. as they shudder, they are the natural choke point to recovery, uh, which is necessary for a recovery from what was the world's first recession, recession that was a recession. Normally men take the biggest hit on the chin in terms of job losses, this time women did. And we can't get back into the labor market unless we have critical social infrastructure in place. The provinces have dropped the ball on good long-term care. Nothing has changed since the spring in terms of how long-term care is provided yeah. uh, and how human resources and the same thing is happening in childcare. So when you get social infrastructure that is essentially abandoned by the jurisdictions in charge of it, we are not gonna to get to healthy and we are not gonna to get to recovery anytime soon. So I give the provinces by and large a failing grade and the federal government thus far, you know, B plus maybe, maybe higher than that, like gold star thus far, the problem is going to be when do you turn it off and how do you cave into pressures to turn it off? All very good points. And, and I'd like to kind of keep on this theme of, you know, focusing a little bit on where our vulnerabilities lie as we look at recovery. Um, you know, Armin makes some really excellent points around social infrastructure. Um, what other vulnerabilities, um, Craig, I'll start with you, do you see just in terms of our ability to recover? I'm thinking, um, in terms of, you know, we're seeing a boom in uh, real estate right now, people spending a lot of money, fixing up their homes, moving, buying new homes. And, um, you know, household debt has always been a, a bit of a, a sore spot uh, for Canadians writ large. I'm just curious how, how much of a vulnerability you see that as being. Um, so when we look at the, the, the recovery that we've had thus far, um, two elements that really stand out that have helped really drive a lot of the recovery has been the, the rebound in consumer spending, in, in particular like the rebound in retail, where you know, spending actually got back to pre-COVID levels in June, even though the composition of that spending had changed. And the, remarkably ro the remarkable robustness of, of housing markets across, across the country. Um, now it's not all equal. Like real estate in Alberta is not is is not delivering a strong performance, but that province is being hit not just by the pandemic, but also by the oil shock. But if you actually look at home prices in Calgary and Edmonton, they're basically flat in in a terrible economic environment. So real estate, I would say, across the country has held up remarkably well. And when we look at like cities like Toronto and Vancouver, it, it's been absolutely absolutely booming. And you. In a, to a certain extent, you scratch your head a little bit and you go, oh, wait a second, we just had a massive unemployment shock and we're having a real estate boom. Typically, these two things don't go hand in hand. Well, part of it goes to what we've been talking about in terms of the, the, the in, unequal impact in the labor market, right? So more of the jobs have been lost by low paid, low paid workers that have worked in the hardest hit industries. Well, the bulk of those individuals would have been renters, right? Not, not homeowners. And at the same time, interest rates have declined and, and the, and, and, and income, if you actually look at aggregate income, uh, one, one of the other remarkable things, one of the remarkable stories that's linked to the, 
the willingness to spend and and I think much less to the real estate market is the fact that although we had a massive increase in unemployment in the second quarter, we actually saw uh, household income increase, not decrease. And it was because of the massive transfers being done by government, where, which was, you know, from an economic point of view, was absolutely the right thing to do. Right. You know, if we if we took a lesson from the Great Depression, it's 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 if you if you are facing a rece- you know a, a depression like threat or you're th- facing a deflationary threat, it you know that is the time governments need to spend or transfer income to help support the economy. And this is why you know I, I would you know absolutely give the federal government a good positive grade because if they hadn't acted the way they did, they we would have had a depression. Right. And no, make no mistake about it. You know, instead of contracting like five and a half percent this year, the Canadian economy would contract 20 percent and unemployment wouldn't be nine percent net today. Unemployment would probably be like 18 or 20 percent. So without any question, like you can, you know, there you have people that are being critical around some of the the responses. But I, I would encourage people not to do too much armchair quarterbacking unless you're willing to go back and and think about the policy decisions with the information that we had at the time, right? Because it, it, there was an enormous amount of uncertainty at the time. And, you know, this has led the government to, to do things where it scrambles and it puts a policy in place and a week later it changes it, right? Like, you know, the first wage subsidy was something like 10%, you know, and then a few days later, it's like, you know what, it's, it's, it's actually 75, 80%, right? So, and, and the, the, the good thing was that, the government was willing to run the risk of being criticized for not getting it right the first time in order to actually address what the country needed, which was, you know, massive support. It then gets really challenging because as you go forward, you start running into the bigger question around what are you going to do in terms of scaling the, back these programs under over what time frame and, and how are you, you know, and, and what, and what are you going to help, what are you going to do now to help support the recovery, right? And this conversation, you know, tends tends to be very negative. Like a lot of what we, we're currently talking about seems very negative. I would argue that we have a silver opportunity. We have a massive opportunity to basically make decisions that will not only set Canada up for stronger outcomes in terms of the shape of the recovery, whatever letter it looks like, but also actually improve things for the long term, right? Like if we think about childcare, Canada has massively underinvested in childcare over its entire history. And, you know, the COVID pandemic and the impact on households basically revealed or showed or highlighted to Canadians the absolute criticality of that childcare. And if you're going to invest in childcare, you want to invest in early, early child li- learning because that's how you're going to build the resilient workforce of the future. And one of the things we're learning from COVID is we need resilient, flexible workers, right? We, we know that, you know, when, the, when this crisis happened, it revealed something that we, you know, that, that many economists had been flagging for many years, which was our income security framework was completely outdated and was, was not keeping up with the changing shape of the labor force. Equally, we, we have issues around like pre-COVID, we had massive competitiveness challenges. Canada was falling in the international rankings on business competitiveness. And if the government actually, you know, when we talk about the you know massive deficits and should we be worried about deficits, the best solution that we could have is a strong, you know, a strong growth agenda, you know, that allows the economy to grow, that generates the income, that then creates tax revenues, that allows the government to then, you know, deal with its fiscal responsibilities down the road. And that means like right now is the ideal time to actually have very fundamental questions around, you know, what does the policy framework look like? How do we create a more competitive Canada? And this is, you know, from an individual business point of view, I would say I have been very encouraged by the conversations that I've had with management teams in this country around their business models, because, you know, they're not just responding to COVID. They all, you know, everything, you know, in many cases, everything is on the table. Like how should, you know, what should our business model look like for the future? And since we're making all these changes because of COVID, you know, maybe we should think about other things as well. And, you know, some of the positive things coming out of, out of, out of COVID is things like the shift to digital and the shift to flexible workplaces and the like, which are actually forcing businesses to, 
to rethink how they do things. So I would actually contend, you know, if you want to put a positive spin on this, like, yes, there is a lot of uncertainty at the moment. Yes, we don't know if there's going to be a double dip. Yes, we don't know how strong the recovery is going to be. But man, do we have an, you know, in the, in the category of not letting a crisis go to waste, now is exactly the time for businesses and governments to think about their policy positions to build for a much brighter future. Okay, there's so much to unpack there. I don't know even where to start, but um, Avery, I want to I want to move to you. There's, the, it's an interesting point that that Craig makes around this great opportunity that we do have around growth agendas. Um, I I don't know if it's the cynic in me who always worries when you know you put government and agenda together, but um, I, you know. We just saw a paper come out by Dom Drummond uh, with CD Howe warning about the possibility that we could be once again facing, you know, a debt crisis or, you know, austerity measures following, you know, we saw it, Pierre Trudeau in the 1970s spend like crazy and then, you know, Chrétien Martin had to come in and, uh, you know, introduce a lot of austerity because the debt and deficits were getting out of control. Um, so. I'm curious whether you see this as an opportunity or whether you see concerns here about, um, you know, our children paying the piper 15, 20 years from now. Well, well, first let me say that I think the number one priority government for government right now is fighting the fire that's in front of us. Yeah. So I wouldn't be penny pinching on the fight. And I'm a little bit different than Craig. I also, I don't actually think that the government should be spending a lot of time thinking about 2030. I mean, there will be a time to do that. Uh, but, I, you know, you asked me if would I give a grade on the government? Actually, I'd, I'd give the grade of incomplete, because if I was going to judge the federal government on this overall handling of the pandemic, the number one thing that history will judge them on is yet to happen, which is how well do we do in terms of getting at the front of the line for the vaccine, disseminating the vaccine to, hunt, to you know, the tens of millions of people in the country? Because if we flop on that, I assure you, if every American is vaccinated before the Canadians are vaccinated, that will be a bad story for whoever's in power in Canada to deal with later on. So we still have a long way to go to managing this crisis. As far as the deficits, and is that a huge issue? I mean, the, the Drummond Report, if you looked at it, it assumed sort of interest rates in the decade after this one will be in the three and a half percent range on average for governments, uh, for the Canadian government. We haven't had interest rates like that entirely in the last cycle. So to me, you know, even pre-COVID, we weren't anywhere near that. So I'm not quite, I don't think the math is quite right there. I do take the point, however, that, you know, governments can't, you, you can't run deficits in the hundreds of billions in good times uh, and have the central bank buy your bonds, to keep interest rates down. You will have inflation if you do that. You become Argentina, the Weimar Republic, whatever. We know what happens if you do that. So. They do have to get the deficit down. I'm not as worried about how do you time the withdrawal here, because if you look at why we have such a big deficit now, it is the money going to the CRB or the wage subsidies or the rent subsidies and so on. All of these are temporary programs whose usage will melt away and spending will actually fall sharply once COVID falls sharply. So it doesn't take a big design from government to have the deficit melt away. When we think about things beyond the COVID era that the government could and should do, and there are tasks for the government, and certainly, you know, we've talked about a few here. Do we have the right healthcare system in place? Do we have a good plan for diversifying a bit if we need to in Alberta? Because they, they themselves say we need to diversify out of energy a bit. So what role does government play in that? Those are all important things. But I think we have to we do have to pay attention to what overall size of government can we afford? Where are we going to get the revenue if we want a bigger government? It's not running hundreds of billions of dollars of deficits every year. So we do have to keep that uh, in the back of our minds that that's going to be relevant for this post uh, COVID period. I would say still that the biggest driver of the recovery is going to come from healthcare. It's going to come from getting rid of COVID because that's what started it. And in fact, it's one of the reasons why I think that the efforts we've done have actually set us up in some ways for a very nice snapback, because what we prevented was the multiplier effect. Um, we prevented that the wave of job losses in the segments of the economy that were very vulnerable to social distancing needs and are still vulnerable, 
We didn't let them ripple into job losses everywhere else. In fact, we regained all those other jobs because we gave income support. And so we are setting ourselves up, if everything goes right, to reaching the point where COVID has melted away. All these households have not become insolvent because we've kept them afloat. And now there's heavy pent up demand for all the things we would just love to do today, uh, but can't. Everything from going to the movies to going to restaurants and so on. Uh, and we'll see a nice snapback in that sector. So I think by and large at the federal level, they've done the right thing in keeping people afloat. Now they just have to manage getting us the vaccine on a timely basis when it's available. That's a big logistical exercise. Don't minimize the role that governments are going to play in that. Um, you know, if you've tried to get your flu shot this year, it hasn't gone so smoothly yet. And this is going to be a shot that every single person in the country, hopefully, will want to get. So this is a big exercise uh, for us, but I think it's going to be the most important exercise. Um, I, I would say one other thing, too. If, you, if you're talking about governments and child care, I think in Canada, we actually do have one province that has done very well on that. And I'm talking before COVID, and that's Quebec. Because if you look at Quebec, uh, what they achieved with subsidized child care was a dramatic rise over the previous couple of decades in female labor force participation. In fact, if Quebec were a country on its own, uh, and I know some Quebecers would like to be, but uh, I personally hope they never that never happens. But if they were a country on their own, I, I believe they have the second highest female participation rate for women of, of sort of 25 to 55, uh, other than I think it was something like Finland or somewhere. But, you know, they're right up at the top of that list. And it's obvious that subsidized child care was a big part of that. And then what's the economic consequence? Well, actually, the consequence was that Quebec fiscally did much better than the Avery Schenfelds of the world actually thought they would be able to do. Because mm -hmm. if I went back a decade earlier, we looked at Quebec's aging population and we said, well, they're running out of workers. So therefore, their trend growth rate is going to be pretty low. And therefore, they're just not going to get the government revenues. Their trend growth rate actually did much better than we thought, and it was because of the rise in female labor force participation. So it had a fiscal payoff. It was part of the story for why Quebec was able to uh, take on its deficit, although those listening from Alberta would say, yes, that and some big equalization payments. And so I, I, I had equalization right over here. You weren't even thinking that. So <laughs> I'll, I'll say, yes, that's relevant too. But they also grew faster than we thought because of that. So I think those are important issues, but I think that for government right now, they have to keep their eye on the ball. The eye on the ball right now is keeping businesses afloat and they've improved their rent subsidy. That's an important measure for those closed restaurants for the time being. Um, keeping households afloat. And um, as Craig said, household incomes haven't gone down, they've gone up. So they're doing a pretty good job there. And then getting the vaccine deployed. Those are the top priorities right now. Okay. Armin, I, I want to get you into this and, and get a sense from you in terms of we had to choose, um, I guess, a couple of questions. But, you know, what do we see as being some of the basic key legacy things that we may see coming out of this whole situation? And, and if you had to choose one or two things that we could um, change, whether that is, um, you know, uh, some kind of subsidized health, uh, child care, there's a lot of talk around basic income. Love to get your thoughts on, on, on that. Well, definitely the legacy of this moment is going to be uh, more corporate concentration. Uh, so we're gonna have to do something about that. Um, we're gonna be losing huge parts of the business ecosystem. Uh, and the ones that will be left standing have got deep pockets and those are the ones that will be able to increase their market share. And so corporate concentration is going to be a huge issue all around the world. It's certainly not unique to Canada, but something that we're going to have to struggle with. And what that means in terms of bargaining power, because everything going into these last 40 years has led to about 10 years ago, around 2010, the OECD, IMF, World Bank, all started using this term inclusive growth because growth itself was not enough. Too much of the benefits of growth were flowing into two hands. And so everybody started talking about inclusive growth about a decade ago. And here we are looking at conditions that are going to actually accelerate underlying inequalities at a very dramatic 
uh, scale. So I think two things are the legacies or um, the potential for um, restructuring the status quo out of uh, the pandemic. One of them is related to more corporate concentration, weaker rebound for some people, more government than we have been used to for the last 40 years. I'm unclear that that's gonna result in basic income, maybe. It's possible that we are actually gonna be demanding more basic services, childcare being one of them. Because on the other side of this thing, we're going to have a larger cohort of the elderly. Uh, you know, it's going to peak at roughly one in four Canadians is going to be a senior. Uh, and a smaller workforce that is supporting uh, a smaller working age cohort, age 15 to 65, that it is supporting a growing cohort of populations that are too old, too young, and too sick to work. So we're going to have to make sure more of the jobs people have are good jobs, or we're going to be looking at lower growth, less tax revenues, and less services. In other words, quite apart from the scenario Avery pointed out about the you know Argentinization of, of the Canadian economy, we could be doing it to ourselves by failing to provide the services that support people, which, by the way, also are good jobs by and large when they're done um, as you know well compensated, well trained positions. Uh, so it isn't just the number of jobs in the sectors or how much services, but what kind of jobs we're creating too. And I think going going forward, we're looking at two major inversions from the last uh, from the economic chitty chat of the last forty years. First of all, less mass everything, more bespoke everything, more customized everything, and it's coming to a neighborhood near you, a household near you, because of geopolitical frictions and climate climate changes, impact on supply chains because of technological potential that we didn't have before that comes from how software is developed and shared, where 3D printing can be developed, even the application of technologies to civic tech, which hasn't happened yet, but seems to be on the cusp of happening because of all these market failures in the sector. And that means, again, more government, less market uh, because of an aging population. And that will do things like put a completely different emphasis on immigration policies, public mm -hmm. policies on who comes in permanently, who comes in temporarily, and how we have that balance between getting newcomers to come in and grow the economy and fill in labor shortages, and how we actually upgrade the skills of our own people, particularly those who have faced systemic barriers to getting into the labor market. Not just women, but recent immigrants, visible minorities, indigenous populations, disabled populations. Very so ultimately, I agree with uh, Craig that this is an, a remarkable historic opportunity to put flesh on the bones of inclusive growth, uh, but we can just as equivalently fail to grab the brass ring. Okay, on that high and low note, <laughs> it's a it's a creed occur, I think, for Canadians uh, across the country. Um, we could have gone on speaking, I think, for another hour. It's been an amazing conversation and, and great insight, and I, I can't thank you all enough. I've been told that I need to wrap it up, and I'm going to hand the mic back over to my colleague, Kanata. Yeah, I went by so quickly, and that was indeed a fascinating conversation. Thanks for engaging with us to our audience online today. Craig, Armin, Avery. Thank you for taking the time to share your insights and predictions with our audience today. Thank you to Andrea for having this important and timely conversation. Some sobering thoughts in terms of where we went wrong, when we will return to full economic health, but some voices of optimism in terms of our ability to learn from the first wave. We hope that our panelists' optimism will be carried today. We hope you'll join us for some of our upcoming events. On Thursday, October 29th, we'll host a panel of Canadian journalists stationed in DC for their thoughts and insights ahead of the U.S. election. Thank you to our AP supplier, Van Valkenberg Communications, and Romedian.ca for making it possible for us to come together virtually. Yes, thank you for joining us. Please stay healthy and safe.